to this very special webinar by Mumbai First on air pollution. Although the matters that we speak about in this seminar are to do with uh, air pollution in cities like Mumbai, they apply to air pollution anywhere. And why is this, why is this really important? If you look at Mumbai, it's, it contributes almost 7% of the GDP of India. That means at $250 billion, the, the money which is uh, generated in Mumbai, with its population of almost 20 to 25 million, it generates 7% of India's GDP. That's why it's important. Now, air pollution, just air pollution by itself, impacts this GDP to the level of about 2 to 3%. And this session that we have this afternoon is to explore what the meaning of air pollution is in all its potential dimensions with the help of two experts that we have here, Sumit Saxena from the East-West Center in Honolulu and uh, Dr. Rakesh Kumar, who's from uh, ex-director of NIRI in uh, Mumbai. And I'll introduce them at a bit more length in a moment, but just uh, tarry here because almost Three and a half million school children, six to 18 years, constitute almost 17.5% of the population of Mumbai. And with two million senior citizens above the age of 60, that's another 12%. So almost 30% of our population is very, very susceptible and uh, potentially affected a lot by air pollution. Now, I went to the central Pollution Control Board website, which you can all do also if you like. And I checked out various parts of Mumbai yesterday, which is a Sunday. And uh, Kulaba had an AQI of about 99. Uh, Ghatkopar had an AQI of, of 140. So 99 is kind of borderline. 140 is not good. And Bandarkudla complex has about 150. And Deonar had about 196, which today is about 205. And they have color-coded what the meaning of all these things are. Zero to 50 is green, which is minimal impact. 51 to 100 is minor breathing discomfort. And 101 upwards, breathing discomfort to people with lungs, asthma, and heart diseases. 200 to 300 is breathing discomfort to most people on prolonged exposure. And then it goes to red, very poor, which is respiratory illness, and brown, which is severe, which affects healthy people also. So. What we want to think about here is the cost of air pollution, healthcare costs, productivity loss, premature mortality, reduced quality of life, environmental degradation, and the economic burden. And what is air pollutants? Air pollutants are primarily particulate matter, which is PM 2.5 micron and PM 10 microns. In fact, our, our, our speakers here will tell you a little bit more about what constitutes these air pollutants, primarily vehicle emission, construction, dust, and all that. We will hear about that. Nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, ozone, VOCs, which are volatile organic compounds, ammonia, and all sorts of, of other kind of elements like that. And our speakers will kind of tell you a little bit more about that. And what's being done about all this? We hope to hear that also. There are various things like the national clean air program, switching to cleaner fuels, upgrading public transportation, metro, all these type of things, tree plantation, all sorts of things. And we should also explore what is the effect. And finally, I would like our friends to tell us about what can we individually do to reduce air pollution? Because we like to believe that government is responsible for everything. And there's a lot that we can do also. I'd like them to suggest that also, and that and we should have an action plan at the end of it. So without much ado, I'd like to uh, invite our speakers. Uh, we have first Dr. Sumit Saxena, who is an environmental health scientist, and he's a senior fellow at the East-West Center in Honolulu, which does collaborative work on environmental issues, air pollution, and things like that with countries like ours and Southeast Asia and all that. He's a fellow at the Center for Environment studies uh, at Terry, which is the Energy and Resources Institute till 2001. He did a PhD at IIT Bombay in environmental sciences. 
And then currently, he's also affiliate graduate faculty at the Department of Urban and Regional Planning at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And he's affiliate graduate faculty at the Thompson School of Social Work and Public Health at the University of Hawaii. So a lot of work being done by him. He's been part of committees on indoor environment quality with the U.S. Department of Energy. He's on the advisory group for Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. He's worked extensively in India, Vietnam, Nepal, Philippines, and Pakistan. And exposure to a lot of diverse and challenging environment. The second panelist is uh, Dr. Rakesh Kumar, who's an adjunct prof at the Center for Environment Sciences and Engineering in IIT Bombay, and he's the president of the Society of Indoor Air. So he's got a lot of experience on air pollution control, urban air quality, climate change, sustainable wastewater, and all these kind of things. And he's an MTech from IIT Bombay and a PhD in environmental engineering from CSIR NIRI, where he was a former director in Bombay and the chief scientist. So various awards, Environment Leadership Award, VASFIC Award, Green Excellence Award, number of patents, about 18, and lots of journal publications. So without much ado, I'd like to hand the floor first over to Dr. Sumit Saxena to make his presentation. So the floor will be that uh, he'll make his presentation. I'll hand the floor over to Dr. Rakesh Kumar, and then we'll have a Q&A. And if any of you want to ask any questions, you can post it on the chat and I'll give the floor to you to ask. And then that's how we'll continue the conversation. But um, we are very keen at the end of this to acknowledge our responsibility for air pollution and also figure out what we can do about air pollution apart from the actions which we want the government to take. Okay, so this is to start helping mobilize public opinion to put pressure on the government to sort out all these issues which will hopefully improve our quality of life. So having described our goal in this, I'd like to hand the floor over to Sumit. Over to you, Sumit. I'd like to begin by saying that uh, I'm really thankful to Mumbai first uh, for coming up with this idea of a joint webinar between Mumbai first and the East West Center. Uh, special thanks to Roger to uh, for motivating me to uh, you know do this webinar especially with the uh, east west center alumni uh, chapter here in uh, uh, mumbai it's, it's a sheer pleasure to be physically here in mumbai and a sheer pleasure to in interact with all of you uh, so uh, i had uh, suggested uh, to roger that uh, we do a panel and uh, i'm really grateful the co-panelist, Dr. Rakesh Kumar, we'll have complimentary view. So, uh, five years in this discussion, and then the audience can react to it and provide Kavi the kind of inputs he's uh, seeking on what we can do uh, collectively. Yeah. Uh, before I go ahead, I just want to take a minute to acknowledge uh, that the East West Center really misses uh, Mr. Ratan Tata. He served several terms uh, on our Board of Governors and provided very valuable support uh, and encouragement to the East West Center. So when I suggested to Roger that the title like Stretch Perspectives on Air Pollution Policies and things like that, so I didn't mean to be too ambitious. So please don't expect that I'm going to suggest something revolutionary. I'm not going to suggest anything very comprehensive uh, and things like that. All I'm trying to do is to say that in the public debate, uh, usually there is a tendency to miss out on certain nuances. Uh, and a lot of times these nuances are missed because uh, most approaches are not people-centric. They're a little space-centric, they are place-centric or uh, technocratic. But even though we keep claiming that human health is uh, the prime reason we are concerned about air pollution, at the end of the day, the way we actually try to look at the problem and come up with solutions is very little to do with people-centric uh, method. So is there anything that is uh, people-centric? Uh, so indeed, uh, there is something called the exposure science, and uh, uh, that one is what I'm going to be talking to you about. 
within the whole uh, gamut of risk analysis and risk assessment, there is a, a, a discipline called human exposure assessment, and that's what I'll be speaking about. And that's what my PhD in IIT was about. So the first thing when we do an exposure assessment is we ask ourselves whose exposure are we actually measuring? And I'm extremely grateful to Kavi to, for the statistics that he provided about how many uh, senior citizens there are in Mumbai and how many children there are. Uh, these are the vulnerable populations uh, that one should be worried about, and uh, including pregnant women, asthmatics, even people with heart disease, if they're exposed to air pollution, their condition can become Worse. So the first thing we need to find out is that, uh, you know, are we doing an exposure assessment for the entire population or are we interested in specific groups, multiple groups, if multiple groups, then how uh, does each group's exposure di differ from that of the others? The next question in this framework is where exactly are these people spending their time? And we call this micro environments. And uh, uh, you know, these are places that could be either outdoors, they could be the sidewalk, they could be parks, shopping, outdoor shopping, recreational places, uh, school yards, and so on. Then indoor air pollution, uh, the exposure that we experience being indoors, and I believe Rakesh is going to elaborate on that. These could be exposures while we are inside homes, inside offices, the kids are in the schools. Uh, or inside shopping malls, inside uh, subway stations, uh, and so on. And finally, uh, something that is not stationary, that is the, you know, the exposures you experience when you travel, either on work or going to school or for recreation or for shopping. Uh, so what is the exposure at that, uh, in, in that activity? So there has to be clarity on that and understanding of that. So these are called the micro environments. And finally, in the, one of the most fundamental questions one has to figure out is exactly how much time we spend in these uh, polluted environments. The, obviously in a certain micro environment, which is very polluted, people who are spending more time there are going to be more at risk than people who are spending less time in the same micro uh, environment. So this is the framework, and I also would like to add that I'm aware that I'm speaking to a highly, highly diverse audience. In fact, I don't think I've ever spoken to a more diverse audience, so I will try to keep uh, you know, uh, uh, my explanations very uh, you know, understandable, hopefully. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, about the only theory that I'm going to be talking about. So how do we actually measure? So luckily, with the last a uh, decade or so, uh, engineers and physicists and scientists have been able to come up with uh, low cost sensors. So here you see me in Bangkok, it's my hobby, wherever I go, whichever country where I go, I travel with these sensors and I just strap them on my body and I go about. And this is actually uh, another brand uh, and I'm in a car. And the sensor is linked to a phone and all the computational power is provided by the phone and the display and the logging, data logging is all done uh, in the phone. So using these kind of devices, uh, this is an example of the output that can uh, uh, you know, come out. So this is actually from uh, uh, Vietnam. So I'm traveling from my hotel to my meeting place and it shows you the route I've taken and the color code uh, shows that uh, orange, most of the places it is orange, and some places it is red. Uh, uh, that is some kind of an, uh, a local AQI. And this is actually more of interest to all of you. This is a couple of years ago from Powai. I traveled to a meeting in BKC uh, uh, and I logged the data. So again, you see, that was actually a day where the air was cleaner. Not only was the air cleaner, my meeting was during um, off uh, peak time. So but generally throughout the route, the color coding is yellow, but you do see places where uh, the pollution levels shot up to the orange level danger zone or the extreme red, uh, you know, play hotspot areas. Uh, these uh, occur, these red spots and the orange spots correspond to places where there was either a traffic jam or the car was going way too slow or uh, there was a traffic stop and all the uh, cars and automobiles were uh, idling and the emissions during the uh, uh, 
uh, idling and uh, or, or at these places they created spikes in the person's uh, exposure. But believe me, uh, this was really one of the cleaner days. And as I said, during the midday when off peak hours, uh, the pollution level was less. Had I done this exercise during peak hours, it would have been you know red uh, all over. And then one can look at uh, minute to minute, uh, you know, uh, how the pollution changed. I'm not going to go into details of what pollutants are and what is the particulate matter and carbon monoxide. We can take that up if someone is interested, but it just shows you what kind of information is available these days. So though using these kind of methods, I'll just briefly describe a case study from Delhi a bit old, we surveyed 1,100 households, which corresponded to about 4,000 4, individuals from those uh, households. The first thing we asked them is about their how they spend time in different micro environments. And this chart, I'm showing you only the time spent in commuting or traveling. And one of the very interesting things is that we found that the commuting time of those people who use cars or buses was uh, about 2.2 hours. And those who commuted by motorbike was less, about 1.9 hours. And those who were pedestrians were 1.7 hours. Now that for some people will sound a little contradictory because you have the notion cars are faster. So why you know, are people uh, uh, who use cars spending so much time on the road? But this has to do with urban planning. You know, A lot of uh, uh, the richer and the more affluent people who use cars, uh, they stay in suburbs and they have to commute into the central business district. And that increases their commuting time and that increased commuting time can actually uh, increase their uh, exposure. So the time spent commuting is an important factor in our analysis. So anyway, looking at uh, carbon monoxide, a poisonous gas, what we found is as expected, the People who use motorbikes had the highest exposure, followed by the auto rickshaws, then the bus, and then the air conditioned uh, cars. And for particulate matter, uh, also we found the similar uh, ranking. But what is of interest is that the variation uh, for the motorbike riders was, and uh, for most of the modes, was higher than that for the gases, uh, which means that, uh, uh, you know. The specific uh, route that these uh, different mo uh, modes of transport take also is a determining uh, factor. And then we figured out that uh, looking at just uh, the commuting uh, time, uh, that contributed to a person's uh, uh, exposure, like male workers was 20% of their daily exposure came from the commuting or traveling to work. For female workers, it was 13%, students 12%, and homemakers uh, about uh, 4%. We did a similar study in Hanoi, Vietnam, and you can see the investigators, they're traveling with these sensors. Uh, these are much bigger those days. In the first photo I showed you, it was much smaller. Uh, so this is in a bus. And as the bus was traveling parallel to that bus, uh, other investigators are following on the motorbike, you know, just following the bus uh, using the same uh, set of uh, the same type of uh, instruments. And then we also had uh, people in a car and uh, pedestrians on the same uh, road, you know, point A to point B was the same, but the modes of transport were different. And here, just ignore all the rows except the topmost. We find that the average. Uh, particulate matter it was, let's say, about 450 units. And those days uh, in Hanoi, uh, the, uh, the ambient air quality, uh, as measured by a typical fixed monitoring station, was about uh, 200, uh, 175 or 200. So almost, you know, uh, just by traveling, uh, that exposure is almost twice that of uh, uh, what uh, any AQI or measured on top of buildings will indicate. As expected, the motorbike uh, people were exposed the most, about 580 units of pollution. But interestingly, about 500 units of pollution was exposed, uh, experienced by the pedestrians, those who walked. And this, is, uh, this pattern is very important for some later uh, things that I will uh, discuss. And we also measured uh, you know, inside restaurants and roadside cafes. 
And what we found in this case was for a period of about a couple of hours and the investigators are taking a break here and uh, uh, also measuring uh, pollution that it was uh, about uh, uh, three times uh, the pollution uh, uh, on the, you know, uh, the rooftop. Uh, Jakarta pilot study, one of my PhD students, uh, she did this uh, because, uh, you know, Kavi said, what can we do as individuals? So there is always this thing that, okay, let us go for mass transport. So we had a bunch of volunteers uh, who said, okay, we will shift from either using our cars or motorbikes to using uh, mass transport. In that particular case, it was the bus rapid transit. Uh, those are very, uh, you know, air conditioned modes of transport, uh, very clean, modern uh, buses, bus, uh, the BRTs. Uh, and what we found that in a significant number of cases, the door to door exposure of the person actually increased. Because, yes, while that person was in the bus, their exposure was less. It was a clean bus. But the time they had to wait at the station uh, or walk from the station to their office that uh, compensated uh, for the clean bus so overall they actually their exposure for some classes i'm not saying i'm it's not an umbrella uh, command but for some classes of people their exposure actually increased when they switched from using motorbikes to using um, uh, bus transit and i was reading that uh, recently the metro 3 has been inaugurated in Mumbai, but many people are complaining about the last lack of last mile connectivity. They got off, you know, they from home they come and they get off uh, at BKC, then they are not able to find uh, how, how to go from BKC uh, that station to their particular office. So if they are standing there waiting for an auto or waiting for something, then they are inhaling uh, polluted air. Just the fact that they are waiting or walking uh, to their office. So these are the kind of nuances I was referring to and complexities. So what are the key results? So generally, most of our studies in India and Vietnam, Jakarta, et cetera, has shown that street level exposures can be more than twice that uh, measured by the AQI kind of paradigm, which is generally based on the rooftop uh, monitoring. But also that uh, there are significant differences based on what is your particular mode of transport and also there are differences in patterns for depending on which type of pollutant uh, you're talking about particulate matter is the most sensitive to the type of route and type of uh, mode of transport that uh, is being used so now two years ago i was in uh, mumbai visiting my parents in the newspaper i read these articles that uh, bmc along with the corporate sco sponsorship was beautifying the space below flyovers, especially those days they had just inaugurated the Elphinstone uh, uh, flyover. Uh, so I felt that you know something uh, uh, fantastic is happening about urban beautification uh, because you know in India this is typically how dirty the area under the flyover looks. Uh, either it is garbage or homeless people or criminal activity or you know animals, stray dogs. Uh, so the another project was that under the JJ flyover, uh, they planned to create a library, an art gallery, and even a food uh, court. Uh, so as I said, usually these are uh, very dirty places under the flyover. Uh, so there are places where they have now tried to beautify that space. This is from Vietnam. And this is that Elphinstone flyover. So you can see there is artwork, there is uh, plants uh, all over. So it looks fantastic. So my initial reaction was, wow, finally, no more eyesore. When then bell started ringing in my back of my mind that, hey, hold on, wait a minute. From an air quality perspective, there is something wrong going on here. You see, they have inside it looks i mean really simply out of the world the children can play elderly can come there and uh, chat with their uh, uh, other senior citizen friends and uh, very young children can use the uh, outdoor gym and so on uh, but i i uh, you know thought about this a little more and there was a lot of uh, praise for this uh, kind of activity which I believe at that time, well, a lot of corporate involvement, either through advertisements or philanthropy or simply CSR uh, kind of uh, uh, activities. But uh, from an 
air pollution point of uh, point of view this is actually a bit of a disaster uh, and uh, it is bit, what i'm saying is a bit controversial but uh, i have talked with urban planners and initially they criticized me but then ultimately they came to understand my argument and they realized that you know there was something missing in their training because uh, uh, they were not in uh, their training had not incorporated environmental dimensions see one thing is that this uh, the the spaces is uh, in the middle of the road and that is from the hanoi experiment showed that the highest levels of pollutant happen in the middle of the road not the side of the road and the base of the flyover <coughs> acts as a lid it prevents the dispersion of any uh, pollutant and finally very very often uh, these flyovers are within urban canyons I, on the top you can see a photograph of an urban canyon these are tall buildings on both sides and then an aerodynamic uh, phenomena kicks in. And because of that aerodynamic uh, phenomena, the polluted air is stuck uh, with, uh, you know, with, between the buildings. And in, on top of that, you add a flyover, you know, you're just creating a pressure cooker uh, there. So I went to test this hypothesis. So I went and sat for an hour under the Elphinstone uh, uh, flyover with this uh, sensor. Uh, and just to see, you know, and uh, I did find that uh, again, this was uh, off peak hour around the noon. Uh, the levels uh, were about three times the Indian standard and the WHO standard or more. And more surprisingly, the levels inside the flyover were higher than uh, outside, the, just a few feet outside the flyover on the street. <clears throat> The same thing is happening at Nayak Chalk. If some of you are familiar, this is a very famous chalk. You can see the white triangle in the middle uh, of a very busy intersection. Uh, this is a GIS view. So the government decided to convert the traffic island to a recreation uh, space. Again, looks fantastic. And in the night, it looks even more fantastic. But the people who go there will be exposed to levels of pollution, which are, normally they would not. if you know, they had been away from this traffic island in doing the recreation or playing uh, elsewhere. So uh, <clears throat> the, I will uh, then skip to the next topic. Now, one thing is that I really want to applaud M Mumbai first for selecting a few topics as their, you know, uh, research agenda or priorities, which are uh, very close to my heart. And I also will want to show you that from a pollution or exposure perspective, they are very uh, risky situations because of exposure uh, 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 concepts. This whole thing of uh, making cities and sidewalks and roads uh, walkable. So one particular angle of that is, you know, we, many of us like to go for morning walks uh, or morning jogging or do yoga outside or, uh, uh, you know, play uh, badminton or something outside early uh, in the morning. So in, in Povai, near my parents' place, there is this beautiful park. Every morning, the, these days also, I go here for, for my morning walks. And on different occasions, I carry with me the sensors uh, uh, while I'm walking. Uh, so the one on the right was during the peak COVID time. And uh, guess what? In the mornings, early in the mornings, I like to go there about 6.30, 7 uh, in the morning. At that time, the pollution levels, particulate matter levels were uh, way higher than uh, elsewhere in Hiran Nani Gardens and uh, way higher than, uh, you know, uh, what the AQI was uh, of, of that day or AQI of that day or of the AQI of the previous day was uh, suggesting. So I published my findings in a community uh, newsletter uh, asking this question that do you really think that early mornings are a good time to exercise and the answer is possibly not. So uh, I, I won't go get into the physics of it, but there is a, a meteorological phenomena called uh, inversions, atmospheric inversions. This again makes the city air act like a pressure cooker and uh, especially in the cooler months, the inversion prevents pollution from dispersing. That's why uh, very early mornings, uh, the pollution levels are very high and it is advisable to wait for the sun to come out and heat up so that the pollution, dis uh, the inversion breaks up and the pollution dissipates. 
So when this article was published in the community newsletter, uh, late, many days later, uh, I got a feedback that many senior citizens had decided to change their exercising habits to ensure yeah. that they are not uh, exposed to these high levels of pollution. And also this issue of whom the streets belong to, uh, I don't have time, I want to give Rakesh time, but I again applaud uh, Mumbai first for being sensitive to the uh, issues of the low income groups, the slum dwellers, the street vendors, poor street vendors. And uh, I will be happy to answer questions later, but how the public decides to use sidewalks is a huge determinant of people's exposures, not just the street vendors' exposures, but the shoppers' exposures, the people who come to eat street food, et cetera. It's a huge uh, exposure implication. And finally, the the you know the focus on uh, construction. Uh, so uh, again, from an exposure perspective, uh, uh, building construction is a huge uh, risk. So let me quickly summarize that uh, even though we should continue to set up more uh, monitoring stations, including low cost network stations and so on, but the overall paradigm that we are working in is based on the fixed location monitoring, and that is not a people centric approach. Sorry. Uh, so. If we want to empower citizens with, uh, you know, Kavi was saying, how do we empower citizens? So for me, one answer, it's not a big grand answer, but one answer is empower citizens with personalized information. And that will help them make choices at their level, will help them make the behavior changes at their level. So in terms of low hanging fruit, if you remember the uh, uh, map I showed you when I traveled from Hawaii to BKC, wherever there was congestion, there were spikes in pollution. So anything that Mumbai First can do with other stakeholders to reduce congestion, reduce idling times at uh, traffic uh, signals, using you know camera technologies, using AI to somehow do better traffic management, that is, uh, I think, uh, up uh, Kavi's uh, alley, uh, that kind of stuff. And a little more ambitious, you know, when we do Google map navigation, it tells you if there is a traffic jam ahead, maybe someday that uh, these apps will tell you that, you know, uh, half a kilometer down, there is a very severe episode of air pollution. You may want to change your uh, route. Yeah, Beautification correct. projects, uh, you know, uh, as I said, uh, I'm not saying that just because there is an air pollution issue, there should be no beautification of flyovers, but the, this information needs to be made available to stakeholders and let the stakeholders decide their own trade-offs. You know, if someone says, I don't care about my air pollution, I want to have a beautiful place under the flyover to take my grandchildren to, fine, fine, that's your decision, but at least we have to make that data available. But in any case, there are uh, other options. We can make gardens under the flyover, but not allow people inside them. Or we can cover up the places, air condition them, use HEPA filters, and inside the people can play chess or play uh, uh, carom board or do some other activity. But this open uh, space under the flyovers for people to sit there is a bit of a gas bomb, uh, gas chamber. Outdoor exercising, I think a good uh, low-hanging fruit is to get uh, uh, you know, displays in, installed right in the park itself, you know, Bandra Joggers Park or, uh, you know, Napian Sea Park, uh, all those places. Uh, if you have air quality monitor, uh, AQI displayed in the park itself, that will raise awareness about people, you know, I should not be running if it's so uh, uh, polluted. And uh, for building uh, uh, and road construction dust, because of the proximity to the source, and it's a street level source, it's a huge uh, health uh, hazard. And because this doesn't happen very often in America and uh, Germany, et cetera, this research area is considered not so sexy. And that's why, why countries like India, Vietnam, et cetera, should take the lead in doing more data collection and solutions on the dust. And I do believe that the spraying of roads is a good uh, solution. Now they say you can use even su uh, treated sewage water. On the other hand, the misting of the air, I mean, that is a total uh, cost, uh, you know, ineffective solution. And similarly, the filter towers, I believe, uh, for huge cities like uh, Delhi, Mumbai, it's a, a cost ineffective, very, very cost ineffective solution. But spraying on roads is probably a good uh, uh, idea. Thank you for this, uh, Sumit. You've, you've uh, uh, given us a, 
given us a lot of food for thought in the sense that one never believed that uh, in spite of low pollution commuting methods like the metro and bus and all that kind of stuff, that it's the endpoints and the last mile connect which can actually increase the amount of pollution that you are exposed to by just hanging around for too long, waiting for the bus or waiting for your uh, taxi or whatever and inhaling all this air. So what this shows even more is the need for a systems-based approach at solving these kind of problems and not just solving one small part of it. Like for instance, we built lots of metros, we built the coastal road and all that, but we've not thought of the system as a whole. That the coastal road only means that people from further away will come to South Bombay and clog up the roads, basically. Nobody's thought of that. We built the metros, but we've not thought of how the people will disperse at the various nodes. So you've talked about uh, that and you've highlighted the fact that these gardens which are created at traffic islands and so on are an absolute no-no because the, the exposure to people is much more there. So thanks for this. There's lots of interesting food for thought. One best, one very good idea that, that you suggested is that we should have lots of AQI boards. Why at parks, at any place, lots and lots of them, and they need not be expensive. Like for instance, I was fascinated by the sensor that you are wearing around your neck most of the time. How much does that cost, for instance? Uh, typically across different uh, models and brands, I would say those kinds about $250. Okay, so one can just integrate this very easily with a display and companies could actually sponsor this. And then uh, this idea that you said that you have a pollution map in your Google Maps, right, which tells you which is the best route to take in terms of uh, pollution. So at least being forewarned will help people take avoiding action. So lots of interesting ideas. We'll come back to that. Thanks for that, uh, Sumit. So we'll move over to Dr. Rakesh Kumar. And uh, his his spin is a little bit more on the indoor side, but it'll be very interesting to see what he has to say. Over to you, Rakesh. Uh, thank you, Kavi. Uh, I think it was a wonderful presentation by Sumit. And he has got a lot of stuff which... Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. So uh, from the point of view of uh, outdoor, uh, one thing which he started with, and that is something which is which which hits all of us, uh, you know, how much time we spend where. And, and that's what I thought I should cover it uh, in a way that we understand. Uh, mostly for outdoors, we have discussed across the city how we are uh, doing it. And most of these uh, stations, which are also monitoring, are in only those areas where uh, where it's easy to install. Uh, but the picture which you see here is something where you will find difficult to even uh, install uh, air quality stations. The other side, which is normally not seen, uh, which, which you will find, is that, um, you know, the railway sidelines, uh, the slums, which, particularly in the context of Mumbai, I would say, uh, we have one side uh, where very dense population exists and air circulation is a major issue. The other side, which has become affluent, and when you see some of these pictures of air conditioners, this, these are pictures of lower Pareil area. Uh, you know, some of the offices, all these air conditioners which are jutting out, and they are, they are throwing heat in, in that area and the humidity. So when you have air pollution coming from outdoors, then you have heat and humidity together, then what happens to the people who live nearby? And that's where the issue is. So when we look at all, overall, uh, you know, problem of air pollution, we started this journey in our country when uh, all of us said, uh, you know, Taj Mahal is in danger, and uh, we started uh, taking a lot of the lot of uh, efforts in doing that. Uh, interestingly, last year when we did a did a workshop in Agra, we realized that we have done anything which was possible to do for us in terms of we. We closed a uh, couple of, uh, you know, power plant in that area. We closed a small scale industry. They have been moved away. Uh, there was a railway yard which was using coal. That was also stopped. But still, Agra's air quality, air AQI remains bad. And, and the same thing happens in Mumbai. It happens in Delhi. So, you know, looking at some of these uh, numbers, uh, a few of our group, uh, people who did this, uh, you know, damage calculation, and that is where I would say that at the end of uh, this presentation or later on when we want to talk about uh, how much money should be spent on air quality management, uh, mostly people will say uh, NCAP, uh, National Clean Air Program, which the Government of India started three, four years back, uh, we have uh, allocated 20,000 crore. 
but how much damage are you creating and in, in comparison to that, how much are we spending now? And that's where the question of, uh, you know, money and uh, the GDP that you talked about, where it gets affected, how much of that gets affected and who is getting affected. So the target population who needs this spending uh, to safeguard their health is cause of concern for all of us. Something which is again very typical of Mumbai. Uh, this was a study which was done by KM Hospital. I was part of this. Uh, we we have not bothered about what is happening about other things, bio aerosols, bio uh, you know biological origin particles, and these are the ones which are in local area creating whole lot of disease burden in terms of asthma and respiratory morbidity. There's enough data. Uh, Pune has actually banned uh, public feeding of uh, pigeons, which people uh, do it for religious purposes. But the way it is being done is, is extremely high. And I'm concerned that it's being done in all those areas where we do our running and walking. And, and you understand the risk of that. What we do. So challenges for uh, us is from Agra experiment, from Delhi experiment and Mumbai. These are big, big cities uh, in news experiment. We have done a lot. Uh, we have cleaned up our vehicles from uh, BS0 to now BS6. Uh, we have cleaned up all our petrol and diesel, which used to have sulfur, uh, sulfur content of uh, almost in percent, now below 10 to 15 uh, ppb. So we have done quite a lot of uh, that, but still results are not being achieved. And that's where the question comes in. Uh, our measurement is an issue or are we doing uh, you know, enough for scientific studies? Is enforcement an issue? And do we need to do any change in that? And frankly speaking, whenever we discuss air quality issues, you will find more and more monitoring uh, is proposed, but we hardly look at what the solutions are going to be. So when you look at sources, and this is where I thought uh, I'll bring in a bit of uh, outdoors and indoors together. When we are talking about coarse particulate matter, which primarily comes from construction, biomass, burning, and suspension, right? So when we say construction dust is what is causing Mumbai's issues, I would say if it was so, then the, the haze that you see in the sky, which is about uh, 300 meters, 200 meters above, uh, cannot be because of construction dust alone. It is something else which is happening. When we talk about finer, fine particulate matter, which is less than 2.5 micron and less, we have vehicles, a large number of vehicles, which are contributing industrial combustion. And in some cases in Delhi, we also have uh, DG cells. The other ones which we have not bothered, we have not looked at, we don't even have numbers in place, are volatile organic compounds which comes from solvents, uh, which also comes from vehicles and industries. Volatile organic compounds also comes from our garbage. When it's rotting, uh, many of us can actually feel it when you, um, you know, cross Godres and on the, on the Vicroli side, you can actually sense it. So it is very important that all of the sources which are contributing are put in one basket, and then we report each one of them to show whether we are succeeding or we are not succeeding. Uh, primarily, the method of AQI-based success is not what is working out for us. And I'm not a critical uh, uh, person in that sense, but I'm saying uh, the scale at which we are trying to do that uh, is not something which will show up in, in due course. Uh, I feel just keep looking at AQI. AQI is good for communicating to public, but when it comes to taking action, we need to look at right numbers. So when we look at our indoor typology, which we all know, uh, if you combine all together, one of my PhD students who is also listening to this uh, conversation, she did her work on indoor in Chambur area and part of Mumbai, where it was realized that most of the people spend about 90% of their time indoors. And, uh, uh, and, and, and those people who are rich, they actually spend almost more than 95% indoors. It, it could be car, it could be office, it could be their own houses. So when we look at, start looking at it, uh, it is, it, it also talks about uh, indoor air quality, which is around the building and the structures that we are talking about. So it's better understanding, it, in, it requires that we understand what are those common indoor pollutants. And I'll, I'll talk about the particulate matter and, and, and the purifier that people uh, normally talk about when we want to do it. Health effects for uh, indoor is much more immediate in uh, many cases, and in few cases, it could be uh, much later as well. So uh, we all know that for indoor air quality, uh, the moment uh, spikes happens in Delhi, people start buying uh, indoor air purifier, 
But uh, remember, indoor air purifier actually just takes care of your particulate matter in whatever way, although I'm not a, a, a supporter of this. But besides that, you have so many other things which are there, starting from asbestos, carbon monoxide, formaldehyde, wood products, lead, all of these. And many of these, you will realize they are not particles. They are actually gaseous. And these, when we, when we want to close our houses and run a purifier, purifier is cleaning your particulate matter. But rest of the other stuffs are actually going up in, the, in your house. And that is probably going to create problem for us. So in terms of air cleaning, when we talk about, there are a lot of products which are there in the market. And I would not say in this group that I, I suggest what, is, what needs to be done. But what is important that there are various methods and various means which is used for these technology. There are a few of them which use certain molecules to destroy pathogens or destroy uh, you know, any chemicals. There are some others which are filter types, which actually captures. And there are third one which uses uh, better than HEPA filter, which again takes care of particulate matter alone. And then there are others which are hybrid of you know, one, two, three, depending upon uh, what we do. But primarily, if you see 99.9%, .9 the one which are being uh, advocated, being used, as well as uh, being sold, are uh, basically filter-based. So uh, I just went to the uh, website of CDC, which talks about ventilation in buildings. Uh, we also have building codes in India, uh, which also talks about ventilation. But I just thought I'll highlight you some of the international uh, systems. It says that for any closed buildings and for ventilation purposes, first thing is, of course, less crowding, which is a challenge in our country. But a better HVAC system should be in place in closed buildings. Uh, what we have seen in some of the studies that has been done uh, in cities, then in place of HVAC, mostly we have a cooling devices. So we reduce the temperature. People feel very comfortable for some time. But if you are in that situation, if HVAC is not properly designed and implemented, people start getting headache, nausea, and you know sometimes uh, you know attention deficit as well. The second thing, which uh, which is which is surrogate, I would say, if ventilation is good, your CO two reading should be less than 800 ppm. Uh, outside uh, the ambient, it should be in the range of about 400, 450. But in inside house. I should not exceed 800. And as Kavi has done uh, some experiment uh, on his own, uh, we did some series of experiment at Society for Indoor Environment that in our air conditioned cars, then in the, in the mode where we keep the air to be circulating on a continuous pattern, uh, the, the number uh, which, uh, which, which we have encountered for CO2 goes as high as 2000 plus. And that's when drivers start sleeping. And of course the people who are sitting behind. So it actually very says very very clearly it says that the, uh, there is a cautionary uh, language which they have used that if you are using any product on ionization, dry hydrogen peroxide, and chemical fogging and masking, uh, we have to be careful about what we are trying to uh, improve and what we are trying to handle. Uh, we can't be using our umbrella method of doing this. So that's why all of these uh, air cleaners which are in market which are being used, uh, we must take a very clear cut look what is being propagated. So frankly speaking, whenever there is a bad news reported in newspaper in Mumbai and Delhi, uh, more sales uh, happens for air purifier in our country, which has no regulation as of now. So when we're looking at uh, uh, needs for India in terms of science and technology, uh, HVAC and AC or cooler heater uh, varieties are a lot. Even in poor household where there is no ventilation, people are using air conditioners. What is where the uh, where, where the ventilation is happening? That is very important to understand. A winter-related poor household ventilation is is a concern. You hear every year uh, some kind of news where people have died because of carbon monoxide poisoning because there is no ventilation in the house. And air cleaning, I would only say, uh, should happen only when it's extremely necessary and it's uh, it's the last option uh, when we have not able, we have not been able to solve the problem of ventilation. So when we're talking about building codes, which India already has, but it hasn't addressed each kind of household. It is talking about any household which are being built now. But what do we do for retrofitting such a big uh, you know, mass of housing that we are talking about? So the quality of poor urban or say, uh, you know, houses for the poor is something which is very important. And similarly for uh, this awareness for builders are required. And that's where I would urge Mumbai first to also bring in together all these people that how do, how are we designing the newer ones 
uh, for urban poor. And the last one, which uh, I understand only Godrej is the company which does proper testing and standards for material use. Uh, there are very few companies uh, who can actually do on their own. And it requires that we create a lot of publicity material and tell people that these are the green material to be used in buildings so that your indoor air quality remains cleaner. Just an example, I want to give you some of the olden structure, uh, even in India used to have, uh, I think the Del Delhi few, uh, few of them such examples are there. These are like natural ones, does not require any uh, mechanical system. It's called wind catchers. In, in, uh, in their words, they call it budgies. So depending upon what is the wind speed outside, it can take wind inside or it can, it can evacuate poor air uh, from outside, from inside to outside. And uh, for a hot climate like ours, uh, we need to rethink uh, in uh, refurbishing this kind of technology and processes. So what we need uh, for policy dri driven change, and that is where government has done whatever it could do, but a lot of inputs are required from public. So local need based immersive ideation is required. So I would not say any idea which works in Kulaba would actually work in Dharavi and whatever works in Dharavi will work in Borivali. So we need a uh, different kind of ideation and uh, then provide those options and solutions to our local government bodies. Uh, overarching policy standards for big and closed buildings, as I said, uh, is coming at building codes, but it's only for new buildings. For the older buildings, we don't see much of work which is being done. Village house ventilation is a big area. Uh, with the biggest uh, disease burden in our country is in the village houses where the, where the whole burden of air quality is on the person who is cooking food and our kitchen typically are less uh, ventilated. And similarly for urban poor houses, it's, it's the same situation that happens. And therefore in scientific community, it is important that we bring science to public so that we communicate what we want to uh, do in terms of uh, taking action. So lastly, I would say uh, let's create uh, an air pollution management community where um, across country we share all these ideas and information, use new techno technology and techniques for assessments, and then bring people from different backgrounds like health professional, meteorologists, climate scientists, industries, people, because one person uh, cannot solve this uh, issue at all. And then, of course, create uh, clean air uh, with government and all connected people and concerned people and NGOs in this case. So this is there uh, in, I al almost brought the context only for Mumbai and Delhi, but if you see some of the slums, which are modern slums, which are built, big ones, that we are there in all parts of the world. And uh, that's where the concern is, the way we are dealing with it. So thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. For having given us another very interesting view of yeah, very interesting. the problem. Most importantly, you highlighted something that we haven't uh, addressed before, which is the whole issue of air conditioning. We are taking the heat from inside our houses and throwing it out, which is why a taxi driver told me one day that the city has become much hotter because people are throwing heat. And I think uh, Sumit also mentioned these... Uh, heat island effects where you have tall buildings and they trap heat between them and it uh, the hot air keeps on looping and it increases the heat and humidity of, of a place. And then you also talked about the costs of the air pollution, which in terms of mortality and uh, economic costs. In Mumbai itself, we did a calculation that the cost of uh, air pollution in terms of health problems and missing work and falling sick and mortality and all that is actually thousands of crores, about 2 to 3% of the GDP of Mumbai. And then you talked about uh, 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 the target ventilation should be 800 uh, ppm. A little uh, episode I'd like to share with you. We started monitoring this at IIT. I'm a professor in the computer science department. So we took the carbon dioxide levels at the beginning of a class of about 80 students and one hour later, one and a half hours later, so we had 400 parts per million at the beginning. And at the end of an hour and a half's class, it was about 1,800 parts per million, which is at the same point at which you mentioned a taxi driver will start to feel uh, sleepy. So perhaps on a humorous note, we can't help that students will start to feel sleepy in an air-conditioned classroom, which does not circulate the air. 
Okay, so that's an interesting point. Then you talked about building codes and most importantly, local ideation, right? The situation will change from place to place. And one important point which has come out is that from, from both your talks is that there are two major components to air pollution and AQI. One is vehicles and the other is waste management because often waste is burnt and all the VOCs and all that come out of that. So maybe in this discussion that we can have now, we can perhaps first highlight in Mumbai, what is the major, if you use the 80-20 rule, that 80% of the problem lies in 20% of the uh, uh, segments, what do you think is causing 80% of the problem of AQI in Mumbai? If one was to ask you, I'd like to ask Sumit that, then I'd like to ask Rakesh also that. Sumit, would you like to... Uh, First, if you could just highlight what are the various components of air pollution again, just to remind our our, our listeners here. <clears throat> uh, well, it's, you know, <clears throat> for sure, uh, the pollutant of greatest concern in Mumbai, India, globally, are the particulate matters, and uh, these come in various sizes. Uh, historically, we were monitoring particles of all sizes, then for a long time, only those. Uh, which I have uh, a diameter of 10 microns or less. Now the standard is moving towards uh, 2.5 and so on. And of course, uh, you will soon hear of uh, issues such as, uh, you know, nanoparticles, etc., finding their way into the air, the nanoparticle, uh, plastic uh, coming from plastic and so on. So that particulate matter is, of course, the biggest uh, concern. And one of the reasons why it's of concern is not only is it a particle of its own right, but some of the VOCs and some of the carcinogenic chemicals hitch a ride into the lungs through the particles. Uh, so, you know, the surface of the particle gets coated with uh, harmful chemicals, uh, gases, and the, basically they're piggybacking on the particles into the, uh, into the lungs. Then we have the oxides of sulfur, oxides of nitrogen, uh, carbon, carbon monoxide and the volatile organic uh, compounds. Now, the other question that you started off with is a little more Mumbai and India specific, and I'm afraid uh, I'm not, uh, you know, up to uh, date on that. And maybe Rakesh uh, will have a, a updated answer on. It. So, uh, I'd like to just highlight to the audience also that these particulate matters, especially 2.5. Uh, microns and below, once they get into the lungs, how do they get out? How does the body get rid of it? Or or, or uh, is that a permanent thing which reduces the efficiency of the lungs as we keep on inhaling it? Well, for so sure, it, uh, uh, could you like for sure the, the particles clog up the lungs. And I don't know if you have seen the photographs that have been published by uh, Down to Earth and uh, uh, also, uh, Dr. Arvind Kumar, basically uh, showing many black patches on a non-smoker's lung. <clears throat> see, if it's a person is a smoker, then you can see the black uh, patches on the lung when they are operated. But when the person is a non-smoker, what can explain this? So basically, there's less of flushing out and more of just clogging up. You know, basically, it's uh, like a vacuum cleaner's filter. Over time, it just clogs up the lung. Yeah. A little bit, I'm sure. I, I mean, uh, so a biochemist might get a better answer how these things are flushed out. But a lot of it is just getting deposited and depositing over the lung tissues. So the, the damage is permanent and cumulative over time. So I'd like to ask Rakesh the question. If you use the 80-20 rule, 80% 80 of the pollution that we are exposed to in Bombay comes from where? So uh, I guess uh, this particulate matter thing has been discussed and I, I fully agree with you that the suspension and the construction dust is an issue, the bigger the bigger particle size, which is what creates that, uh, you know, so-called cloud, which you see uh, this pretty bad. But the one which keeps hanging in the sky is, is not only uh, coming from construction dust, it's, uh, it's actually coming from vehicles as well. We have huge number uh, of vehicles which are flying Although we have cleaner vehicles and cleaner cleaner fuel, but they are not they are not running. 
uh, the average uh, during the peak hours is five kilometers and seven kilometers per per uh, per liter. So you you can imagine so much of fuel is being burned in such a short uh, period, and nitrogen oxide, which used to have uh, in the range of about twenty thirty, which many times people used to not measure. Uh, now that is spiking and it is going in the range of about 60, 65 in some places, some corners, and it's high even in the night. So this natural... So would, you agree, natural would you agree that most of it comes from vehicular emissions? Yeah, primarily, I would say. So so, so would you say that 80% of the problem is from vehicular related pollution, which could be road dust, it could be uh, the central dividers in which you have loose soil, which is kind of pushed up into the air. It's to do with how the BMC cleaners clean our, our, our uh, pavements in the sense that they just shift the dust from here to there, but they don't have vacuum cleaning devices like they have abroad, which actually take the dust and remove it. Mm -hmm. it would that also be a problem? So from this, I gather that so waste management, whether it is road waste or household waste or burning of household waste, which generates lots of dangerous chemicals and vehicular emissions are the two major things that we need to deal with. Absolutely. I, I fully agree with you. The one which is tailpipe emission of vehicles uh, is has got less particles now, but they're very fine and they hang out in atmosphere for a longer period. And gaseous pollution create you all that, uh, you know, ground level ozones, which are actually hazy. That's the reason why you see the hazy uh, uh, thing all over the place. The one which is on the roadside uh, dust, which gets resuspended because of vehicles, is something which can be easily dealt with. And as Dr. Professor Sethi was saying the other day, 25 to 30 percent of that can be very easily, uh, you know, handled. Right. So the visual, visual, uh, visibility related local can be, you know, very easily handled by that. Yes. Okay. Are there any uh, questions from the audience here before uh, we kind of wrap up? Because I think we are done as far as time is concerned. But this has been a very fascinating uh, discussion. And now it's up to us at Mumbai First to start mobilizing our community and our city in uh, putting pressure on the government to kind of address these kind of issues. But I think a picture is beginning to emerge out of this. And I'm going to follow up this call by speaking to Sumit, asking him where to get those sensors from. because. I have a sensor, for instance, which I, I monitor my carbon dioxide levels wherever I sit. And also I have a AQI uh, device. It's quite interesting that most of us use air conditions, air conditioners, and these are split ACs. And when I check my uh, uh, CO2 level at the beginning of the evening, it's about 400 parts per million. At the end of the night, in the morning, it's about 1,800, two people sleeping in a room, which means that the CO2 just accumulates and is not good for you. And one of the solutions to all these problems has not been mentioned here. We are all talking about technology and all that. Last question I'd like to ask you, trees, just planting trees, because people don't seem to understand that trees are natural air conditioners. They are humidifiers. They are scrubbers, which remove the dust from the air. And they are also like urban forests. People talk about it as stress reduction uh, agents. And so what can we individually do to reduce air pollution? Now, based on the discussions that we've had in this, we can individually do things like use public transport or carpool, as you said, Arvindarji, switch to cleaner vehicles, hybrid electric vehicles, stuff like that, reduce energy consumption in whichever ways we do, and avoid open burning and things like that. Support and plant trees and promote awareness. I think uh, one very good point that Sumit brought up is that if we have public displays of AQI in all, all uh, nooks and uh, crannies of the city, that itself will, will bring awareness to people about the air quality. And apart from that, reduce, reuse, recycle, stop pollution happening in that way. And most importantly, monitor personal air quality. So, so I think I shall sit down with Sumit and get a list of all the sensors that he has, the ones that give him data on the, on the app. And what we can do is maybe as a community, we can have lots of people having sensors like this and creating a real-time map of Mumbai. Now, I'm a professor of embedded systems at IIT Bombay, and we, have, uh, and we run a very large student training program in this area. So I shall pick this up with both Sumit and uh, Rakesh. 
and uh, and at mumbai first also we shall continue this conversation i'd like to thank our friends in mumbai first first of all roger pereira for having instigated uh, the chief as a chief stirrer upper of uh, mumbai first sanjay obale for having co convened uh, uh, this thing with me as a co convener of the uh, mumbai sustainability forum which is part of uh, mumbai first and the team behind the scenes revati yeah, absolutely satish anushka satish anushka revati revati each one of them have done a fantastic job thank you so absolutely. much absolutely so we have a anushka, wonderful team yeah. here which keeps on arranging these kind of things and last but least is sumit saxena for very sportingly having taken on this assignment and dr rakesh kumar for having joined us uh, today so thank you all very much mm -hmm.